So today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Jonathan Pajo, whom I know primarily as a thinker, um, who's a carver of orthodox icons that are absolutely beautiful. I have one in my house of St. Michael and the Dragon, and an increasingly prominent YouTuber, prominent among intellectual YouTubers, I would say, essentially, as particularly those who are interested in religious and philosophical and artistic ideas. And Jonathan and I have been talking back and forth for, I would think, about six or seven years now, eh? I know, we met in 2015. Yeah, it's time, it's crazy. Time flies. It's crazy, that's for sure. So <laughs> I, I, we haven't spoken for two years, maybe? Yeah, we, we saw each other, I think, when you, your book came out and you came to Montreal for a little event and I picked you up at the airport. That was the last time we saw each other. Yeah, it's a while. A lot of water under the bridge. That's right, indeed. And in your case, literally. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, Jonathan's house was flooded out. That was when? It was in 2019. Um, but we just moved back into our house this Christmas. And so it was a long, kind of a long thing. It lasted a very long time. So. And are you in your house right now? Yes, I am in my, my house all fixed up. And so we're really enjoying it. We're happy to be back. I bet it must have been unbelievably dislocating to be flooded like that. Your whole basement filled with water, if I remember correctly. Yeah, exactly. It was a, a dike broke in the, in the city. And, uh, you know, I think it was thousands of people got evacuated within an hour. And so for my kids, especially it was my kids and even my wife, it was, it was a little bit of a trauma because it was water where we could see the water coming and there were cops and, and, uh, you know, all these, uh, firemen and everything. And so it was a pretty intense moment. Yeah. And wh where, where were you living when your house was underwater? We moved around, we lived at my parents, then we rented a place, then we had to move. And so we ended up living in three places during the about a year and a half that we were gone. Um, so, but it was a, it, it, it was one of those things where, you know, we say symbolism happens, you know, a lot of the things that even you talk about or that I talk about just manifested themselves, this problem of the dike and the, the idea of, uh, you know, corruption or inattention to the situation and then thinking you're safe when in fact you're not aware of what's what's kind of looming on the margins and uh and so for me it was a real learning experience i hope that i've come out of it stronger and more more attentive let's say yeah well i hope so too i mean we all hope that we come out of unpleasant experiences stronger than when we went in although yeah. that isn't always the case hmm. it's the case when things are functioning optimally and when you're fortunate and courageous and I suppose as honest as you can be, but fortunate definitely ranks high among all of those necessary um, preconditions for successful recovery, I would say. Yeah. And I have to say that I am, we are, I'm so grateful to see you back online, you know, that I know you've heard this, but there have been thousands of people thinking about you, praying for you and really rooting for you. And you know, uh, I actually saw Tammy last year I, when I went to bring your icon and, and I just remember just feeling uh, helpless. And, and, you know, she was like, would you go to Russia? And I was like, I'll go to Russia. <laughs> I'll go see Jordan in Russia. It didn't seem like it was a reasonable thing to do. And, and it's probably better it didn't happen. But we've definitely been praying for you and routing for you and thinking about you, Jordan. No, I appreciate that a lot. And I, I'm back to some degree, I would say. I still think I'm running at about 5%. So, yeah, and that's partly why I was concerned about talking to you today. Um, we generally discuss things that are relatively deep, and it's still difficult for me to go deeply into anything that's happening to me because it's so unbelievably awful. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's been hard on my faith, I would say. You know, and it's, I, I, my book is coming out, hey, my new book. I should show it yeah. to you. I just got copies of it yesterday. That's Beyond awesome. order. It's an, it's unbelievable that you wrote that during all of this. I can't believe that you, when you say you're running at 5%, I think that your 5% is, is pretty close to the hundred percent of most people. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's 5% for me and getting the book was actually somewhat of a traumatic experience. I would say, because it reminded mm. me like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concrete reminder of everything that's happened over the last three or four years. And it with all things that I found very difficult to process both on the yeah. social front and on the, let's say biological health front. Um, hmm. So 
I was reading, oddly enough, uh, I, I got a book sent to me by Bishop Barron, the first draft of a book, and it's written by a couple of professors. It's called Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life, by Dr. Christopher Caxor and Dr. Matthew Prechusek, Word on Fire Institute. It's a Catholic response to my biblical series. Um, now, hopefully they won't be too upset about me talking about it today, but I won't talk about it that much. The book itself, um, it was rather a shock to me. They're at Loyola Marymount University. And it was kind of a shock to me to see them talking about my, I mean, these are religious scholars talking about my biblical series. Um, but I think people are just, people don't, a lot of people didn't understand, and I could see it in my react with the way people were reacting to your biblical studies, your biblical uh, interpretations. People didn't understand how is it that he we can barely get a hundred people in our church, and Jordan has a million people listening to him kind of struggle to 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 get through these passages and and do it in a very improvisational kind of uh, existential way. Um, and uh, and to me, it's funny because I mean I think I I have a. Gr I have a deep affection for your the way that you approach things, and I and obviously we connect together in the way we think. And so, to me, it was like this is what you guys should have been doing for a while: is trying to understand how it is that this stuff is talking about reality, and not just a bunch of arbitrary things that you need to believe or that you need to kind of attend to. And and because these stories, they really are telling us about the structure of being, and so. I think that that's the way that you approached it. And, and that's why people are resonating to what you're saying, because they're like, finally, someone can, can, can help us make sense of these stories that we're somehow strangely attracted to or frustrated by or disgusted by or whatever it is. But there's this push and pull with these stories. Um, and so, so I think that I've seen a lot of Christians listen to your biblical talks. And of course, sometimes you say things and they're like, okay, that's way off the rails. And then other times you say things and they can't believe the insight that you're able to, to pierce. And so, so I, I'm not, not all surprised that Catholic scholars would, would kind of look at what you're, you were doing. And uh, we all hope that you're going to do more of that for sure. Yes. Well, I would like to, I'm thinking about trying to attempt a book on Exodus and lecture to, lectures as well, though I wouldn't say that I'm in any shape to do that yet. Hmm. Um, I'm, uh, but it's a dream, let's say. I mean, I'm pretty much completely non-functional for the first three or four hours of the day. I get up and I can barely stand up and I go have a sauna for an hour and often sleep during that period of time. And then at the same time, I cook breakfast. Uh, I use an air cooker and then I go walk for anywhere between seven and ten miles. And even though I can, by the time I get out of the house, I'm dizzy as, as can be and it's difficult to stand up. But after about a mile or two, I get my legs under me to some degree. And then by two o'clock, I'm kind of functional and although extremely anxious. And then mm. um, I'm able to do a little bit of work and often to sit down at four o'clock. My mind seems sharp enough, although my memory isn't good. I can't bring things to mind like I used to, uh, mm. which is quite distressing. And I have very little emotional resilience. And I'm worried for that reason about the release of this book. I mean, I, I just did a Times interview, London Times interview, that was really yeah. We followed that. Let's say it's that frustrating. It's it's it's. I mean, it's funny because this, you know, again, it was like the same stories are playing out again. This person goes after you, and then it just turns against that person, and and it's just it, she's exposed for for the fraud that she was being in during that interview, and so. You know, I think in the it's end, it's so strange I, that it keeps happening over and over. I mean, I've really <laughs> decided not to do mainstream interviews now for a good while because I've. It seems to me that I've gone to the well of public sympathy, so to speak, enough times, and that if this happens to me two or three more times, let's say, people are going to rightly say, you know, how many times does it take for Peterson to learn? And so I don't want that to happen. I mean, I've been. You know, I feel an obligation to my publishers, obviously, to talk about the book. Um, although that interview had virtually nothing to do with the book, we hoped that we, I would be able to discuss my health issues with someone who would treat them squarely, and then I could ignore them from then on in. But um, uh, that isn't what happened. Um, well, it's been—it's a sign of the politicized discourse. Like you, you, you. 
it's a sign of the breakdown that we're going through, that we see this capacity to have so entrenched a side that people are can't doesn't doesn't matter what they do it doesn't matter what they say they don't feel like they're responsible because in a way you're the enemy and you know and it's not just you it's other other it's between different groups but if you're the enemy then everything is justified and so well i think a huge part of this is is driven by the desire to have an enemy yeah yeah you know um, there's it's it's very difficult to feel it's an easy route to self-righteousness to have an enemy. Exactly. And, yeah, and, and it's a great place to put all evil. Mm, yeah. And because you attract so much attention, you're an easy, you're definitely an easy target. Well, that's um, the theory. It seems not to turn out that way. Yeah. But it's also was the timing, you know, the way when you kind of came up in the public uh, sphere, there was a massive shift happening in culture. And I think that's one of the things you could feel and that was happening around us. And to some extent, you know, Donald Trump had something to do with that as well, in the sense that it was this malaise that was there and this kind of, this jostling and this, this, uh, and this is what led to all that kind of discourse. And so I think that you, you were identified, you became identified almost mythologically, I guess, as, as a character and, and people, you know, have, treat you that way and they act with you that way in many respects. Yes, and it like becomes you, very difficult to, to understand. It's become very difficult for me to understand what character I am. <laughs> you know, so much has changed in my life over the mm. last five years. I'm, I've been on leave from the university, so that's very destabilizing. I don't have my clinical practice anymore. And so I was, you know, seeing 20 people a week. So that's a huge transformation in my life. My my house has been completely renovated. It was renovated while my wife was ill. And so we didn't, uh, well, it, the renovation went on in our absence. And so I'm a foreigner in my own house, which is, hmm. which is, although I'm starting to become accustomed to it. And there's some things I like about the new house, but I don't feel at home in it, I wouldn't say. And I've only been here for two months in the last three years because I was on the road. And then, well, I, all this and so that, and everything that's happened has been very disruptive for my family. And of course, Tammy got so unbelievably sick and, and with something that was supposed to be fatal and recovered more or less miraculously. Um, mm. And then I've been so unbelievably ill or still am. And I, I have just, I just don't know what, where to put any of this. Um, yeah. I, I can't think about the past at all because so much of it is, incomprehensible, especially over the last five years. I can't think about the present because I'm in so much pain. Hmm. And I can't think about the future because I don't know what I'm going to do. And I have no idea how long this pain is going to last. It's been, I've been in pain, really severe pain for two years now. And, yeah. um, and that's, it's, it's a strange thing because in this book, one of the chapters, the last chapter is called be grateful in spite of your suffering, you know, and um, I went every through every sentence in that chapter a very large number of times because much of the time while I was rewriting it particularly, I was in a lot of pain. Hmm. And um, like it's, crip, it, it's, it's, it's a pain level that's hard to fathom in some sense because I would say every single day I have now is worse than any day I ever had in my life before I got ill. Mm -hmm. So, and then I know very well that um, adding bitterness to your malaise is a very bad idea. You know, it doesn't help, but that, that I can certainly see the attraction in that. I feel like shaking my fist at the sky and com complaining bitterly and, but it, it doesn't help, but, it, but there doesn't seem to be any relief either. And so mm -hmm. that's. It's so it's so perverse. It's shaken my faith. I suppose um, I I'm in this perverse position where my work has, in principle, helped so many people, and yet I don't seem to be able to dig myself out of my current circumstances. So, well, or even to make sense of them. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that. I think that the role that you've you played is a is a 
kind of a transition role. And th that transition manifests itself to you as a, as a trying to have your feet on two sides of rifting of an uh, two islands that are floating away from each other. And you, you, you're trying to hold on. You're trying to kind of help people focus on the middle and help people avoid uh, radicalization and avoid falling into camps in a manner that will lead to God knows what. And so I think that, I think that that's the role that you played. And it's, and it's been like, I've seen, for example, people transition through your work, transition from worlds, moving worlds. That's really what I've seen happen. It's more than just changing the way, changing your opinion or changing your mind about something. It really is about changing the world you inhabit. And so that's a, that's a crazy, that's a crazy role to play. And especially because, like I said, you, you have your foot, it's like you kind of have your one foot or one eye, let's say, looking towards, I would call religion or looking towards Christianity or, or something like that. And then you have another eye, which is still very much immersed in a kind of secular humanism. And you have one leg that is, you know, you understand people that are more left-leaning. You understand people that are more right-leaning. You have this capacity to kind of understand everybody, but you're, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that means that you make enemies on, on all sides too. Well, you know, the overwhelming response that I've got publicly has been, I would say, traumatically positive. Yeah. And you wouldn't think that that would be possible, really, but I find it that way. I mean, partly it's overwhelming to have people constantly tell me in person their responses to what I've been doing. It's very emotional, and I get caught up in that quite quickly. And of course, on YouTube and the social media platforms, YouTube particularly, the bulk of the comments about me are very, very positive. I, it's 99 to one often in terms of likes and dislikes. It's, yeah. And, and it's too much. Well, I don't know how, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, I don't know what category to put it in. I don't know how to conceptualize it. I mean, part of, part of me, the practical part of course says, well, I just happened to adopt a new technology at a time when it started to boom and filled a kind of niche that was empty in that technology at that time. But in some sense, that, that doesn't really cut it, you know, because it doesn't have anything to do with the content. And then I think, well, I have been dealing with these, well, borderline religious issues. Well, certainly not just borderline. There's lots of religious people who seem to think that I'm dealing with religious issues. And well, and that's really what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. So this book I mentioned earlier to, talked about disagreements with my conceptualization of Christ, let's say, and which I, and I'm not sure what that conceptualization is, by the way, <laughs> exactly. It's a mystery to me. Um, but but I can say some some concrete things about it. I mean, I certainly I, I understand and appreciate the symbolic significance of the ideal human being. And that finds its embodiment. And I took these ideas in large part from Jung and, and Eric Neumann, that, that Christ, is a it, Christ is at least a representation of the ideal man, whatever that is. And, and we, we all, interestingly enough, we all seem to have an ideal. And we, and that I, or that ideal has us, right? And that's where, it's very interesting to consider the role of conscience because your conscience will call you out on your behavior. And so it seems to function as something that's somewhat independent, or at least as something that you can't fully voluntarily control. Because if you could voluntarily control it, then you just tell the pesky little bastard to go away or to pat you on the back continually because there, there must be few things in life more pleasurable than, than being a fully committed narcissist to really believe that everything that you do is right and that you're a good person. And I suppose if you could wave a magic wand and rearrange your mind so that it was constantly telling you that, you'd do it. But you don't seem to be able to do that in relationship to your conscience. It trips you up. And so 
And so it tells you when you're not living up to your own ideal. And that mm -hmm. means that you have an ideal and you don't even know what the hell it is, but you certainly know when you transgress against it. And I know mm -hmm. that there's a strong line of Christian thinking that's identified the conscience with divinity, uh, sometimes with Christ inside, sometimes with the Holy Spirit. And those are very interesting conceptualizations, but you can think of them psychologically and you can even think about them biologically, you know, to some degree, because we're so social. If we don't manifest an appropriate moral reciprocity, we're going to become alienated from our fellows and we won't survive and we'll suffer and die and we won't we certainly won't find a partner and, and have children successfully. And so, to some degree, the conscience can be viewed as the voice of reciprocal society within. And that's a perfectly reasonable biological explanation. But, but the thing is, is the deeper you go into biology, the more it shades into something that appears to be religious because you start analyzing the fundamental structure of the psyche itself. And... And it becomes something, well, it be becomes something with a, po with, with, a, with, a, with, with a power that transcends your ability to resist it. Hmm. So, okay, so you can think about Christ from a psychological perspective, and the, the, criti the critic, my critic, this particular critic that I've been reading, said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And of course, people have made that claim in comparative religion. Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a, there's a representation of there's a historical representation of his of of his existence as well. Now you can debate whether or not that's genuine. You can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that, but it doesn't matter in some sense because this well it does, but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story and so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth and in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen... Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real. Like, we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world. But the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to... And that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too... It, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ or if you believed that history and, and let's say, the narrative make meet, let's Both, say. Both, I yeah. think. I think you... Because when you believe that, you buy both those stories. You believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch. Yeah. I mean, we saw that, you and I. I mean, this is a trivial example, but we had a, when we were discussing, we had a sequence of discussions around frog symbolism four years ago. Yeah. That was very bizarre, to say the least. <laughs> you know, and that was a trivial example, a relatively trivial example of the narrative world and the objective world coming together. Didn't feel yeah. that trivial at the time. Well, the way the way that I like to deal with this is that one of the things it it it's already there in your thought. It, it's already there in the way that you talk about reality, which is that one of the constitutive aspects of how reality unfolds and how it appears to us is something like attention. 
right? It's something, there's a hierarchy of, of manifestation because everything that, hap- that appears to us in the world has a, an infinite amount of details, right? It has an indefinite amount of ways that you could describe it, that you could, angles that, by which you could analyze it. And so nonetheless, the world appears to us through these hierarchies of meaning, right? I always kind of use the example of a cup or a chair. Like a chair is is a, just a multitude of things. It's a multitude of parts. How is it that we can say that it's one thing? There's a, there's a capacity we have to attend. And this capacity we have to attend is something like a co-creation of the world. And so the world actually exists. Well, a chair is a good example because, you know, you can try to define it objectively, but you end up with beanbags and stumps and... Exactly. And they don't have anything in common. Well, they're both made of matter, you know, for whatever that's worth. It's pretty, pretty trivial level of commonality, yeah. but you can sit on them. Yeah. And they, that's what they have, There's a them. mode of being which defines mm-hmm. them. Well, and that's so strange. So many of our object perceptions are projected modes of being. And so even the objective world is ineluctably contaminated with its utility and it, then, therefore with morality. Exactly. And so I think that that's the key. The key is that. Once you understand that the world manifests itself through attention and that consciousness has a place to play in actually the way in which the world reveals itself. And so you can you can try to posit a world outside of that first person perspective, but it's, yeah, it's good kind luck. of diluted. It's, it's a diluted uh, activity. Well, it's also it's very, very difficult because you don't you, you don't know what to make of something like time because time has an ineradicably subjective element. And du- duration, which is different than time. Yeah. I mean, time is kind of like the average rate at which things change, but duration is something like the felt sense of that time. And if you take away this objectivity, it isn't obvious what to do with time. And I think physicists stumble over this all the time, so to speak. So, and this is something that this this intermingling of value and fact was something that I never thought I never thought I made much traction with with Harris with Sam Harris. He he didn't seem to me to be willing to admit how saturated the world of fact is inevitably with value. And I yeah. actually think he's denying the science at that point, because for everything I know about perceptual psychology, there's a great book called uh, um, Vision as a... Oh, God, now I can't remember the name of the book. So that's a memory trouble. I'll remember yeah. it. No uh, worries. The, the idea is that if that is true, then there are certain things which come out of that. There are certain necessary uh, things down the road from that, that insight, which is that attention plays a part in the way the world lays itself out. Um, and that one of them, and one of them is that the stuff that the world is made of is partly something like attention, something like consciousness. And that has a pattern. And that pattern is the same pattern as stories. It just, it just, it, it doesn't lay itself out exactly the same, but things exist with a pattern, which is similar to stories. They have identities, they have centers, they have margins, they have exceptions. And that's how stories lay themselves out. Like, so a story happens in time, how an identity, let's say, uh, is broken down and then reconstructed. You could say that that's basically the story of every story, how something breaks down and is reconstructed. And so that is a way for us to perceive uh, the identity of things. And so if the world is made of this, then it's actually, it's actually our world, our secular world, which is a strange aberration on how reality used to exist for every culture in every time from the beginning of time, which is to take that for granted, to take for granted that something that they didn't call it consciousness, but intelligence and attention are part of how the world lays itself out. And it lays itself out in modes of being. And one of the things that comes out of it is not only that, but like you said, it's not only that you have ideas, but it's that ideas have you, or that it's not only that you engage in modes of being, it's that modes of being have you. And that recognition means that the first level of the first level of attention to that looks something like worship it looks like celebration it looks like a it it's like a 
the the thing which makes the let's say the National Hockey League so successful has more to do with celebration than just a bunch of guys on skates on a piece of ice, you know, throwing a puck around. There's a celebration of the purpose of that thing and it manifests itself through a bunch of stuff, which it, one is like a trophy that stands in the middle on the top of a bunch of, on a stand and everybody looks at it and kisses it. And, and, and so there's this, this veneration, yeah, well, you know, then, and there's then, mascots. You know, the, hockey and, league, the hockey league example is very interesting because it's a, it's a, it's a social game and you know, all the players are, they're attempting to aim right. Right. So there's a symbolic element to that. Sin is, misplaced aim yep. and so right. you hit the you hit the small space in the net blocked though it may be by your enemies and everyone celebrates that and, right. and you do that in cooperation with other people and in competition with other people and if you do it properly not only are you a brilliant player from a technical perspective but you're also a great sport and so there's an ethic there and a morality and And this is why people are so upset when hockey players or any other pro athlete does something immoral in their personal life is because it violates the, the ethic that, that's being celebrated as a consequence of this great game. Yeah. And, right. So you can see that, that the striving for an ideal mode of being, the religious striving for an ideal mode of being is central to what it is that makes hockey um, addictive. That's right. Yeah, it necessarily. And the, and so God, one I saw of the that things, in pro wrestling. There's yeah, a great documentary, sure. uh, uh, Bret Hart, called Hitman Hart. It's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen, and it portrays pro wrestling as a stark religious battle between the forces of good and evil. And Bret Hart, who at one point was the most famous Canadian in the world, was overwhelmed by his the archetypal force of his representation as the good guy. It's yeah. a great documentary, Hitman Heart. And and it shows you how how, you know, pro wrestling is is it's not the world's most intellectual activity to say the least and people can easily be dismissive of it, but one of the things I loved about the documentary was that it attempted to understand from within what was compelling about what was being portrayed and it was mm. a religious drama. It just yeah. it was shocking <laughs> and brilliant. And so So that is that is actually there is a there's an objective part of that that there's an objective way in which these patterns kind of come together and manifest let's say higher and higher versions of this drama uh, and so the sports drama has a certain level but it's it's limited to a certain extent because it still happens as a confrontation let's say between two irreducible sides and so what happens in something like the story of Christ is that that gets taken into one person. And so all the opposites become the king and the, 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 the criminal, the, you know, the highest, even in the image of the cross, you have this image. And it, as Christ is being crucified, they're putting a sign above his head saying that he's the king. As Christ is being beaten, they're giving to him a crown. And so Christ joins together all the opposites. And so in his, in his, story you see if you if you're attentive to these patterns you see the highest form of this pattern being played out and one of the aspects that has to be there for it to be the most revealed or highest form is that it also has to include the world of manifestation i mean it can't just be a story it has to be connected to the world so that's why christians insist on the 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 fact that jesus is not just a story that he's an incarnated man, that he was incarnated. But I don't believe their insistence. I don't believe, that, well, this is, this is because I don't, it isn't obvious to me. And I think maybe I derived this criticism from Nietzsche, but I mean, people have asked me whether or not I believe in God and I've answered in various ways. No, but I'm afraid he probably exists. That's, that's one answer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, but I'm terrified he might exist. That that would be a truthful answer to some degree, or um, that I act as if God exists, which I think is, I do my best to do that. But then there's a real stumbling block there because there's no limit to what would happen if you acted like God existed. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I believe that, that acting that out fully, I mean, maybe it's not reasonable to say to believers, you aren't sufficiently transformed for me to believe that you believe in God. <laughs> or that you believe the story that you're telling me. You're not, you're not a sufficient, you're not, the way you live isn't sufficient testament to the truth. And okay. people would certainly say that, let's say, about the Catholic Church, or at least mm. the way that it's been portrayed, is that with all the sexual corruption, for example, it's like, really, really, you believe that the Son of God, that, that, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and yet you act that way, and I'm supposed to buy your belief. Mm. And, and it seems to me that the Church is actually quite, um, guilty on that account because the attempts to clean up the mess have been rather half-hearted in my estimation. Yeah. And so I don't think people, uh, people don't manif Christians don't manifest this, and I'm including myself, I suppose, in that description, perhaps <laughs> um, don't manifest the transformation of attitude that would enable that enables the outside observer to easily conclude that they believe. Yeah. Now the way the way to deal with that, or the way to to understand that, is that it they do, but they do in a hierarchy. There's a, there's a hierarchy of manifestation of the transformation that God offers the world, and we kind of live in that hierarchy. And those above us hold us together, you would say. And so in the church, there's a testimony of the saints. There's, there are stories, there are hundreds and hundreds of stories of people who live that out in their particular context to the limit of what it's possible to live it. And even today, there are, there are saints, living saints, who, for example, like in the Orthodox tradition, we have this idea of what they call it the gift of tears or the joyful sorrow of, of people who live in prayer with weeping, constant weeping. Uh, and it's this kind of strange mix of joy and uh, and sadness, which they which kind of overwhelms them, and they live in that joy and sadness nonstop, and they pray, you know, without end. And so that exists. But then we, in this, that's one of the reasons why. That's kind of one of the reasons why when I talk about this idea of attention, like it manifests itself in the in the church as well, is that you often say. And I understand it when you say something like, you know, I act as if God exists or, you know, I, I'm afraid to say that God exists. Uh, and I think it's because you you think or you tend to think that the moral weight like of that is so strong that you would we would crumble under it, that you would just be crushed under it. And and I, I think that, that, that and I think that that's I think that I I, I understand that. But. The first thing that, to act as if God exists, let's say it this way, to act as, as if God exists, the first thing that it asks of you is not a moral action. The first thing that it ask, asks, asks of you is attention. That's why to act as if God exists is first of all to worship. Like that's, and, it, and I know people are gonna hear this. Well, gonna then, say, I okay. have a, then I have a terrible problem with that too at the <laughs> moment because I'm in so much pain. Like one of the things that one of these theologians discussed the idea of, and sorry, I want to let you get back to your point, but he yeah. discussed the idea of the yoke of Christ being light and that there was joy in it. And, um, and there's a paradox there obviously because it's it's also a take up your cross and follow me sort of thing, but um, the fact that I've been living in constant pain makes the idea of joy seem um, cruel, I would say, and so and I have no idea how to reconcile myself to that. I mean, I've reconciled myself to that by staying alive despite huh. it, you know, um, although by staying alive despite it, but there's very little worship. And it doesn't mean I'm not appreciative of what I have. I'm, I'm not only am I appreciative of what I have, I do everything I can to remind myself of it all the time. And so does my wife. I mean, she's changed quite a bit as a consequence of her struggle with cancer, you know, has mm. become much more overtly religious, I would say. And, you know, we, 
say grace before our meal in the evening. And it's a very serious enterprise. And it always centers around gratitude, you know, mm. for, well, for, for the ridiculous volume of blessings that have been showered down upon us at a volume that's really quite incomprehensible. But despite that, um, well, let, despite that, I'm struggling with this because I don't know how to reconcile myself to the, to the fact of constant pain. Yeah. And I don't, I feel that it's unjust, which is halfway to being resentful which yeah. is not a good outcome. No, I, I, I agree. And it, I can't speak like I can't, I don't know how to speak to that because I don't necessarily don't have that experience. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't have that. I don't live with constant pain. And so I don't know what that would do to me. It'd probably, it's probably one of the reasons why it might ruin me, you know? And so, um, it's very difficult to answer that. I think that the answer, like the answer has been the cross, like that's been the answer. It's an easy, maybe it may be easy for me to just say it that way. Uh, but that's always been the answer of, of Christianity, which is that, that God went to, to the cross and that God went down into death and, and plunged down into death. And there, are, that there are mysteries hidden and there maybe they're very well hidden, but there are mysteries hidden in that than that depth. Um, but uh, it's not. I don't think it's my job to uh, to to moralize to you at this at this particular moment. So we talked about the narrative and the objective touching, and so I wanted to touch on that again. Is that like I? I, I understand C.S. Lewis's argument. And, you know, I'm even inclined from time to time to think, well, I've got the choice between believing two impossible things. I can either believe that in the world is constituted so that God took on flesh and was crucified and, and, and died and rose three days later. Or I can believe that human beings invented this unbelievably preposterous story that stretched into every atom of, of culture and it isn't obvious to me that the second hypothesis is any easier to believe than the first, because the more you investigate the, the manifestations of the story of Christ, the more insanely complicated and far-reaching it becomes. So I read Ion, for example, and for all of those who are listening, if you want to read a book that will completely make you insane, then you could read Jung's Ion. And it's a study of Christian symbolism in astrology, which doesn't sound particularly dangerous, but or 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 even particularly necessary to read, I suppose. But Jung, Jung describes the the juxtaposition of astrological and Christian symbolism, and it's a brilliant book, and it's terrifying because he 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 outlines the concordance between the levels of symbolism over several thousand years, and it's mm -hmm. obvious when you read the book that no one plotted this. It's not a conspiracy. Whatever's going on to make that concordance occur isn't something that we understand. And it seems to be best understood as one of these situations where the narrative and the objective touch. The saturation of Christianity with fish symbolism, Jung associates with astrological movement of, of, of into the house of Pisces. And, and so, he, he describes how a, a drama, so ancient people saw a drama played out in the sky, and that was a yeah. projection of their imagination. And that projection contained symbols that were associated with the emergence of Christianity. And so you, you can see in that the, the, the alternative explanation is that there's this, there's this unfolding of a symbolic landscape over centuries or millennia that's part of human biological and cultural evolution, but that, that starts to touch on the religious anyways, when you, when you describe it in those terms, mm -hmm. like it's, it's, it's the operation of a, of a cognitive, of a natural cognitive process, let's say natural slash cognitive process that supersedes any one individual or any one culture. And so and I, I've never seen a critique of ion, you know, I think people <laughs> read that book and they think, Oh, 
it's like John Allegro's uh, The Sacred, The Mushroom and the Sacred Cross. Do you know of that book? I, th I believe that's the title. Well, that's another book you read and you think, well, I have no idea what it, it's a study of mushroom symbolism in Christianity. And it's another book that, you know, it, it claims that Christianity was heavily influenced by psilocybin use and it was published in the 1960s. It's an amazing book. But it's another book you read and you think, I have no idea what to do with that. I have no place to put that book. So, but Ion is really like that. And well, one of the things that, for example, you know, we talked about just before the idea that, um, you know, the idea of Christ being a dying and resurrecting God. And, you know, that's really actually not the case. If you actually just look at the story of Christ and not just the story in scripture, but let, let's say the whole story as it kind of developed in tradition and kind of uh, melded together. In the ancient world, you had this idea of gods that went down into the underworld, you know, either that went down for some reason to visit or went down to save somebody even or you know, or, or, or died and then, and then rose again. But that's actually not the story of Christ, because if you, if you understand the full tradition of the Christian story, we think that Christ died, went into Hades and then destroyed death. And he pulls everybody out of death. And then that's it. Like what other story are you going to tell after that story? You have a story of someone who dies, goes into death and then and then destroys death and then that's it like that that's the thing with Christ's story that every story every aspect of his story reaches the limit of storytelling and it's it's impossible makes to it go archetypal. beyond it right that's right that's right well even from a psychological perspective that's correct and that in itself is a kind of miracle and so you're stuck in some sense constantly having to choose between miracles it's like okay it's a, it's a figment of the human imagination. Fine, but it's the limit figment in multiple ways. How did that happen? And also, but as soon as you start to start to think that the world is made of attention, the idea of just a figment of somebody's imagination, especially <laughs> so, uh, just a figment of someone's imagination, which is happens, like you said, over thousands of years within communities of thousands of people, it just becomes a ridiculous statement. It doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It's like, yeah, it only means something if you assume that, and, and Jung pointed this out, it only means something. It only, it, to say it's a figment of imagination and have that brush it aside means that you think that imagination is nothing. And Jung pointed out constantly that you should not attribute nothing to the psyche. It's what you depend upon. It's, it's <laughs> the ground of your existence. It's, 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 it's not nothing. It's the thing you, that you take for granted more than anything else. So any, anything that you can recognize as a story will definitely be manifesting patterns that you can recognize. And so they can't just be brushed aside from, this, from the most insane conspiracy theory to the, the most you know, like childish fairy tale. Anything that manifests itself as a, as a pattern of story that you can recognize it has a certain level of value, it has a, enough, enough level that if you pay attention to it, you actually can gather some, some, some nuggets of, uh, of how the world works and how the world lays itself out. Uh, you know, and that's why like, if, if I do symbolic interpretations, I can do it for scripture, but I can also do it for some Marvel movie or some video mm -hmm. game or mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. because that's just the, for you to even recognize something as having being, it's already part of that world. It's already manifesting these patterns. This critic said that the mere psychologization of Christ was insufficient because, and you made the same case in some sense, that it doesn't make sense unless the narrative and the objective world truly touch. And I think you could debate that because I think that there's some utility, there could argue to be, be some utility in a secular version of the hero myth, you know, that the best way to cope with existence is to, for, to tell the truth and to face what you don't know forthrightly, and that will enable you to orient yourself within our finite and bounded existence that ends with our death more properly, more accurately, more advisedly than any other route. I've seen 
people from Orthodox priests to you know the more the most uh, Protestant Protestant you can imagine recognize in the way that you represent reality something that has value something that has value because you are you are manifesting that that pattern like what you're saying is is true uh but i think that i think that if we if we if we take seriously this the prop the relationship between attention psyche and the way the world reveals itself to us then it scales up it scales up after that it 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 jumps up a level and uh, it also scales up in terms of because one of the things that one of the things that 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 you talk about, like looking up to the star and and looking up to the highest thing you can look at and then aiming towards that, you know, once again, one of the things that that does for is that the first thing you do is actually where it's a form it's attention. The people don't like the word worship. It's a form of reverence, a for, form of veneration. You submit yourself to that aim. It's not just that you see the aim and that you aim for it. You actually have to submit yourself to that which is to what you're aiming. And so that's Sacrifice to it. Exactly. And you have to sacrifice to it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, let's say, the religious version of this has to move towards the highest possible aim and also one that we can do together. Because like the lower aims, like you could call them something like lower gods, let's say, or angels or whatever you want to call them. Like these lower aims... They have value, but they're all fragmented. But for this to stack up, we need to be able to look towards the same image. We need to look towards the same aim, and that will bind us together. And so we don't, we don't also, then we don't also end up being just kind of individuals who have the weight of the world on our shoulders, but we're a communion of saints. We're a communion of people who are submitted to, aiming towards, worshiping the same Point. Yeah, and I believe that that's necessary. And and I've I've had some ex- profound experiences, which I can't really relate here. That of of the necessity for that community is that this whatever our fundamental moral load is, immense though it is, um, crushing though it is, even um, requires the participation of others. So even if you were the perfect you you would need other people hmm. to to be along with you it's a collective enterprise even though it's an individualistic even though it requires the perfection it requires as much perfection as is possible at the individual level that's not enough there has to be that communal element as well you need help we all need help to aim as high. the highest aim requires communal endeavor yeah and it's also because it actually is the way that everything works, you know. It's like the chair aiming to be a chair is a, is a constitutive of parts which are joined together towards a, a a same goal and therefore hold together as a being and manifest the chairness of the chair. And that's the same with you. You have all these thoughts, right? You have all these feelings, all these these contradicting things inside you, and you need by aiming up towards, you know, the the. I mean, I believe that the, that the image of Christ, let's say, by aiming towards the image of Christ, you constitute your being into that being that's able to attend, to sacrifice, to love, and then that scales up with people. I agree. People well, together. and I think you are aiming, and this is another, something else I tried to point out to Sam. Um, you are, you're aiming, you're either aiming at Christ or something lesser. Yeah. Or if things get really out of hand, you're aiming at something opposite and you don't want to be doing that. But, and this is a matter of definition in some sense. And and Mm -hmm. it's actually not impossible to understand is that you aim at something better, generally speaking. I mean, maybe you're out to cause pain, but forget about that. You, you aim at something better. You wouldn't do it unless it was better. In fact, it, it virtually defines better. Like the, the whole idea of better is predicated on the idea that there's an aim that's beyond you. And then the highest of those aims is the amalgamate, the highest aim is the amalgamate, amalgamation of all higher aims. And that's a perfect mode of being. And, and that by definition, that's a psychological perspective again, that by definition is Christ. And then, but then there seems to be something too convenient about C.S. Lewis's insistence that that also had to manifest itself concretely in reality 
at one point in history. And I'm not like I, I I don't understand why I should believe that. And I don't, I tend not to believe things without a why. There's always a why. And, yeah. and I, there's, there's a hurdle there that I, that, that, well, that I waver on constantly because, I, well, I already said that you're, when you think these things through, at least my experience has been, if you think them through sufficiently, you end up with, the choice between impossible alternatives and so yeah but it, it has to do one of the ways to see it maybe is is it has to do with the recognizing of the goodness of the world or the goodness of creation that that the world is capable of manifesting these patterns right so if you want to understand for example the big conflict between the early gnostics and the christians that's what it was all about because the Gnostics basically wanted a disincarnated Christ. They were saying, you know, and they viewed the world as utterly fallen, as having no value, having to be escaped, having to be fled in every way. Whereas Christianity posits that it's a non-dual, it's a non-dual proposition. It's saying it's, it all comes together. That's the, that's the promise. It all comes together. And so it has to come down. Right. And so it has to come down at every level. And not only that it has to come down into the person of Christ who's incarnated, but that person has to go down, down into death to the very bottom of the world, you know, to the belly of the Leviathan and then come back up. And so the whole world is declared as once again, is declared as ha being capable of participating the, in this good. And so and so you could say, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't that one. Maybe it wasn't, you know, it's like, why would it be that particular, particular place where it happened? And well, it had like, to well, be that's some place. That's the story. I mean, that's where that's the, there is no other story like that story that we have. And, and so once you recognize that this is part of the declaration that the world does embody these patterns, that it leads to this, it leads to the, 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 this, this story of, of, of a man who embodied them absolutely and is bringing us in him to also embody them in a way that will transform us. You know, like the, the, the ultimate goal of, of Orthodox vision of Christianity is, is theosis. It's to become God, to become God through, through transformation and participation in God. So that's the final goal of everything is to become participant in the, the divine. And how do you, how do you distinguish that from Catholicism? No, I, I mean, in terms of that, I think that it's a difference of emphasis. I think for sure the Orthodox emphasize theosis more than the, than the Catholics. The Catholics are, are kind of iffy about theosis in terms of, it's there in some of the thinkers, but it, I would say it's probably not official Catholic doctrine, but I think without theosis, you're missing the point of the whole thing, right? You're missing the point of, of everything. Like why, why do things exist, right? Like wh why do things exist? And so I think that the idea that they exist to participate fully in their most perfect form, like that's what they're called to, 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 part, to, to do, you know, and, and it ends up being a declaration of the ultimate possibility for goodness in the world. I think that that's, yeah. Well, it, it seems it seemed to me I've observed, let's say that it's possible to it isn't obvious to me that anyone wants to leave, live a meaningless existence. I don't think you can live a meaningless existence without becoming corrupted because the pain of existence will corrupt you without a, a, a saving meaning. And it also seems to me that you can sell the story that meaning is to be found in responsibility. When I've tried to sell that story to myself, I seem to buy it. And when I've tried to communicate it with other people, it renders them silent, large crowds of people silent. And that's strange because I, I'm not sure why that is. It, it's perhaps because the connection between responsibility and meaning had never been made for 
in, in that explicitly somehow. Because meaning gets contaminated with happiness or, or something like that. But it's to be found in responsibility. And then you could say, well, there isn't any, any responsibility that's more compelling than trying to aid things in the manifestation of their divine form. That should be an adventure that could be sold. And I don't know why the church can't do it. I don't understand that. And, and because it seems to me that that's something that I've done, at least in part. And that accounts for the strange popularity of the biblical lectures in particular. Yeah. And, but I've also, and I, I do believe that. I do believe that, that the right striving is to attempt with all your heart to encourage things to develop along that, towards that divine goal. Like, what else would you possibly do once you think that through? It's like, hmm. you're always aiming at something that's better or you wouldn't be aiming. You're always moving towards something that's better or you wouldn't be moving. So then why wouldn't you move towards the greatest good? Yeah. Well, it's because it's terrifying, I suppose, in part. But then, as you know, I've tried to put that into practice in my life, and it's tearing me into pieces. Yeah. I don't know, though, if if one of the reasons is because you're also alone. And I, you know, I, because you, I mean, at least to my understanding, you're not in a, in a, in a community. Um, well, you, it's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to say. Because fans it's, aren't I a certainly community. Haven't last, well, they've been a community. I mean, yeah. one of the things that has held me together, certainly, is the commitment that I feel to to the people who've been so positive towards me and my family. Hmm. I do feel that as a community. I understand what you mean. Why the hell not go to church? <laughs> you know. I know you wasn't going to come right out and say it, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're not that blunt about it. But it's not just you know it's it's not just about going to church. I one time I I told you something and and I don't know if I could drive if I was able to drive it through. There there's something about being in a hierarchy that is that because there's an aspect of being in a hierarchy that you talk about, which is this kind of striving to to kind of be the best within that hierarchy. But there's an aspect of being in a hierarchy, which is that the hierarchy covers you. Oh, definitely. There's no and, doubt about that. Yeah. And mm. so there's something about submitting. That's why the lowest, mem the, the lowest status members of a chimp group will still fight off interlopers. Yeah. And so there's, there's a value in being in a community and a, and a hierarchy where you, like I go to confession, right? I, I go to confession. I go to my priest and I confess my sins. And... And I give that to him. He actually takes responsibility for, for an aspect of listening to my sins and, and kind of participating in my salvation. And, he, and so the weight ends up being distributed across the community. It's not, so you don't actually just bear it on, your, on yourself. And it's not just even, that, and it's not just a living community. It's, a, it's not just those that are alive in the, in the hierarchy, but those that, are, that have left their story all the saints are part of this hierarchy that you engage in, that you participate in, and that you see as consolation, as examples, as, you know, as examples of people who have lived through difficult things that you can kind of, uh, that you can shoulder up against, you know? And so that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of insist with, at least for the people that watch my videos, is, is it, when I say go to church, it's not just because I'm trying to moralize you into doing something. It's because it's a it's actually a participation in how the best vision of reality works. I've got no objection to any of that. <laughs> but no I've seen you. I've seen you. Objection. I'm probably one of the only people in the world that has actually seen you in church and seen you, yeah, you and how that squirm go? and yeah. squirm in church. Why? See, the other thing, I was reading, again, I was reading this book, and it's been mostly a jumping off place for me to think. It's like, there's also something, because I'm not inside the church, 
so to speak. It's hard to say what the utility of that is. The utility of being inside the church. Of being outside it. Oh, being because outside I'm an outsider church. talking about religious matters. Yeah, but I think that I think that I think that it has played a great role. Like I, I've often said something that I've often said that you're something like King Cyrus. If you know the story of King Cyrus in Scripture, King Cyrus was a Persian king uh, who told the Jews to go back to Israel and build their temple. So he wasn't Jewish, like he wasn't, he wasn't an Israelite. He wouldn't believe in the God of the Israelites, but he was like, hey, you know, that temple of yours looks pretty nice. Why don't you just go back there and, and rebuild your own, own thing? And so that's definitely an effect that I've seen you have. You know, the number of people that have become Christian because of you is hilarious. Sorry, it's not hilarious, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of this strange thing because you, you, you kind of stand outside and you look at, you're looking at the door and you're looking at the church and you're saying, Hey, this isn't not so bad. You know, look at this. What is, what is going on here? Like, what is this about? And, and then because of that, no, it's also, of- do you think you've got something better? <laughs> you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day when we were walking, because as I said, I walk about 10 miles a day right now, try to keep myself under control. And you know, he, he was raised a communist in Poland and, and, is, and then an atheist. And he was complaining, I think, I think this is what he told me, that he was complaining to his parents at one point about a religious wedding that they were going to, despite not believing. And he mm. said as he got older, he realized he had nothing to replace that with. It's like, okay, throw it out. Fine. Okay, now where are you? Well, you're just as bad off as you were before, but you also don't have that beautiful thing. Yeah. It's like, what would happen if we dispensed with Christmas? Well, if it's We'd logical. It's a good thing to find ask a way to Sam Harris shopping. and the That's new the atheists. It's like, let's get rid of Christmas. Or we, or we could say we could make it entirely secular, but then it would just disappear. But you know that's not what's going to happen because religion is inevitable and we're seeing it coming back in very strange ways. It's going to be a weird, woke, uh, identitarian religion, which is which is going to come back. That's why and primitive, atheist, you know, it, it, part yeah. of it's part of it's going to be tribalist. intent doesn't matter. Well, yeah, can you believe that? Yeah, so it's a it's a scary thing. Like that's you could say that that's one of the failures of the new atheists is that they led to the. Well, they partly led to the new woke uh, phenomena because they they didn't realize that you can't get rid of religion. You can't get rid of rituals. You can't get rid of the problems and opportunities of identity. All of these things are going to come back. If you try to just, if you try to brush them aside, then they're going to come back in very weird ways. And without you realizing what's going on, you'll have people kneeling to a shrine of a man who was killed by police and putting a halo on his head and you know, and self-mortifying themselves and doing all kinds of insane things or that look to you insane, but that you need to understand it's just, it's just this religious impulse gone, gone off the rails. So. Yes. And then the question is, what's the right place for it? That's right. You know, I've, I've, I've thought in my, I suppose it's a form of comedy that Catholicism is as sane as people get. You know, it's Baroque, right? And, and, and go- it's Gothic, not Baroque. It's Gothic. It's dark. It's, 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 it, it has the same aesthetic in some sense as a horror film. And I'm not being, I'm not being, I'm not saying something denigrating by that. It, it, I mean, it's part of its strange mystery. And all that strangeness is necessary because people would be much more insane without it than they are with it. Hmm. It's a container yeah. for that religious impulse, and that impulse is to the to the good. Yeah, and it, and it, and the image of the of the crucified Christ, and also the act of communion gathers in all the extremes together. Right? It's like if you think of the symbolism of communion, you'll notice that it gathers in every extreme, from the highest to the most uh, transgressive. All of it comes together. It's worth unpacking in- that. It's yeah. ritual cannibalism in the service of God. Yeah. Yeah, and it, but it's also it's also seen as a as a normal like meal of communion and it's then also seen as a a, a a a sexual union because you there's a relationship there's a notion in which then 
in the altar and in that moment of communion, there's this joining of heaven and earth. You know, they raise up the chalice and there's this joining, which is which is this image of this, this sexual union between God and the soul, between God and his church. And so all of it, it just jammed into this into into this ritual as a, as a kind of center of reality, you would call it. Um, and so, like you said, if you get rid of that, then you're going to have all kinds of strange, factitious versions of it that are going to pop up and are going to try to replace it. And it's leading to the fragmentation of our world and to the breakdown of the West, for sure. So back to this idea of the, 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 the mythological level and the historical level conjoining, and I thought of that as convenient. You know, it's, it, that, that's a stumbling point for me in relationship to the Christian story. It's, you say, it has to be like this if the world is constituted in a good manner. And it's the has to be. I mean, is that... So how about, how about say, if, it, just sorry, if it's sorry, constituted just, just in let me patterns. say one. Just let yeah, me say ahead. this one thing, because yeah. I've, I've been struggling towards it, this whole... It's an act of faith. And so let's say that your faith is that you decide to make the notion that reality is good the, the cornerstone of your faith. It's something that you, that you what, that you believe, or is it something that you courageously assume? And is there a difference between that and belief? And if you courageously assume that the world is good, that reality is good, then the touching of the narrative and the objective in this manner that's demonstrated by Christ, that becomes necessary. Is that the idea? So I, to me, it's funny. I don't see it as an act of faith in the way that we think of an act of faith, like this jump of faith or, or whatever. I, I see it as an act of trust, faith as trust, you would say. That's fine. That would be a courageous right. assumption yeah. if it's trust. And, and, and it's trust in the sense also of, so when we talk about the good, we always have to be careful not to just limit it to the good, to the moral good. There, there is the moral good. But when we talk about the good, we're talking about the good in a in a much larger way, and the good is the the is the pattern of of the things, right? And and in the sense that the the fact that the world lays itself out as ordered as pattern inevitably, that there is no way around it. You cannot avoid the order of the world because because the in order for you to even perceive anything, it has to have an identity, it has to have a hierarchy, has to have a margin, has to have all these things. It's all there in every aspect. Every act of perception. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so in every act of perception. And so it's that. So every act of perception presumes a value hierarchy. Exactly. You can't avoid it. And so it's not, so it's not like an act of faith in the sense that I, 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 you know, I, at the outset, think the world is nihilistic and, 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 and chaotic. It's like, no, I don't. I think that on the contrary, I think that you could say it in a religious way that the love of God holds the world together and it's inevitable that things are held together by these by these these patterns of being that are always aiming towards the good, even in the very identity of whatever it is that you're you're encountering. Let me ask you something personal then. I mean, you you weren't born an Orthodox Christian. This is something you came to. How? Well, I think that it has something to do with what you said before. It does have something to do with the sense that Christianity had fallen away from its original story and its original all-encompassing, uh, let's say, cosmic narrative. And so it was really, I would say, in searching for that and kind of discovering symbolic thinking on other fronts and feeling like I was confronted by this, like, okay, so I can see these patterns. I can see the world through these, through, through this coherence. And it's like, why is it then that, that Christianity doesn't have this? Uh, and then, then after more looking and more searching, I realized that it did, that not only it did, but that some of the earliest, more, some of the most, you know, powerful early saints talked about the world exactly this way, you know? Um, and, and so when I discovered that, then I looked around and I saw, for example, that iconography, that the relationship between icons and architecture and liturgy and, and all of this was like this amazing giant pattern, which was 
reinforcing, manifesting, making you participate in the way the world actually existed. And so it was like this kind of self, you know, this, 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 this positive feedback loop, I guess you could say it in a good way, where it's like you, 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 you recognize these patterns, you engage in them, you see them, you, you sing them. It's like this whole thing where you're engaged. Um, and so I realized that it was really in the Orthodox Church that this was the most, that had been the most preserved and the most alive, and that I would hear, you know, contemporary Orthodox speakers or thinkers or theologians who talked about the world exactly in that way. And so I thought, okay, so this is the place. And also because they kept the idea of theosis as the ultimate goal. Because I think that that's, if, you know, very, very early, St. Irenaeus, which is, you know, like, early third century said the logos became man so that man would become God. That's one of the early, some of the earliest saints said that, you know? And so it's like, that's really what Christianity is. And so that's what, that's what ultimately led me to, uh, to, uh, well, to it is the greatest of all possible visions. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, but I think that, you know, I think that it's there latent even in, in, in other forms of Christianity. And I, one of the things that I've been trying to do is, help people kind of wake up to that reality and try to see it wherever they are. And how's that going for you? <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm really serious. I haven't talked to you for a long time. I mean, you've got this, I mean, you've had a strange few years as well. I've had a strange few years as well. It's all your fault, by the way. Just yeah, <laughs> it certainly feels that way. But it's a, it's a good, it's a good in that sense. I mean, I've, I've been surprised in the past four years since I met you and you kind of put me on, out there in the world, you know, um, right now I have with like 90,000 people following me on YouTube and there's a community of, I would say symbolic thinkers. I'm giving them a place to, to, uh, to write like on my, on my website, I'm, I'm putting up a blog. There's communities that kind of get together and talk about, about this, trying to reinvigorate it in their own communities, whether that wherever it is they come from. And so I've been just nonstop excited about, I mean, in a way, sad, to see that I think the breakdown of Christianity is, is going to continue. Like I, I'm not, I, I don't have short-term hope for, let's say the situation, but I do believe that there are, that there are seeds which are kind of being planted and there are people who are getting ready and, and, uh, and will bear fruit. So, so it's been just, it's been amazing. I have to say, and thanks for that, by the way. I hope, I guess you're welcome to the degree that I had something to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Did you want, I know one on Twitter, you, you asked about the virgin birth. I don't know if you want <laughs> if you still have juice, if you still have energy to talk about that or if, or if, or. If. Sure. Why not? <laughs> well, the, 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 one of the things that is important, I would say, in Christianity is understanding that the, the role that Mary has to play, let's say, in the, same, in, the same, in the same way that we talk about how the reality of Christ came, let's say, had to manifest itself in the world for us to understand that the possibility of this thing, the possibility of how everything comes together, right? Uh, in the same way, so in, for example, in the Old Testament, you have theophanies, you have places where God and humanity meet. So on the mountain of Moses, in the temple, uh, in the Garden of Eden as well. So you have these, they're usually at the top of a mountain or they're at the end of a temple. Okay, so it's still a mountain in that sense. And so that's a place where two worlds meet. That's the narrative world and the objective world, really. Exactly. So the, the, the invisible world and the visible world, the, the world of, of, of logos, the world of pattern, and then the world of possibility, right? They come together. And then that's when the, the, the coming together at that point is where you see something. So it's like that for, for everything. That's like where everything miracles happens. occur. Yeah. But not just, yeah, miracles are like super events. Like they, they, they show us the pattern of reality in a more, in a, in a more concise way, but everything is like that, right? So even a chair is a bunch of possibilities, right? That encounters an idea, can encounters a purpose, a logos. And then, then you have a chair. You can't have just a bunch of stuff or else you don't have a chair. You need that to meet. So at the center of every thing, of everything that exists, there's a little temple, a mini temple, and there's a little incarnation, right? A little, like a mini one. It's mm -hmm. not, I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't want to, don't want to, to, to seem, uh, 
uh, heretical or anything, but there's this little like mini thing that happens. And so that aspect has a, has a, a, a lower part, which is the, the nexus of possibilities, the coming together possibilities, and then this thing that this logos, which comes down. So this nexus of possibilities, you could call it a mountain, a house, a temple, a body, that's Mary, right? That's, that's her, that she's the place of manifestation. So she's the Ark of the Covenant, she's the temple, she's the mountain, she's all of that. Um, and so, and then, in, and then we play that role, you could say the church, the body of Christ, we play that role, we come together in love, and then the divine logos descends and manifests to unite the body, right, together, and to reveal himself in that unity of the body. So we see Christ in the unity of love. So Christ says, they will know you by how you love each other, because that's how you know that a body exists, is that it's coherent, it holds together as a body. Um, and so this body has to be dedicated. It has to be dedicated to the thing which it's manifesting. So like, let's say, let's say you have a turkey, you know, uh, a car and uh, two bits of grass, and you think, I'm gonna make a chair out of that. Well, it's not gonna happen, right? It's I not really gonna didn't happen. I think you were gonna go that route. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, this is it, this is what it's about. It's not gonna happen because that's not dedicated. And so in the same way of, a, of a, a woman and her husband, so a woman has to be dedicated to her husband for the union to be recognized and fruitful. So if a woman is, is, not, is not faithful to her husband, then there's confusion on the identity of the child, right? But if a woman is dedicated to her husband, which means that she's actually a virgin to all other, other identities, She's virginal to all other identities and she's dedicated only to the one thing. So this idea of virginity is super important because it's about dedication. It's about not being mixed or not being- That's non uncontamination. Uncontamination. And so then you can understand that in order for something to manifest the entirety of the whole pattern, right? So it's like, so, so for, for, for someone to be the place of manifestation, for the whole thing. The well, that is what a mother themselves. does. Like, right. it's what a mother right. does because she dedicates herself great, to a greater or lesser degree to bringing someone perfect into being. And the more she loves, the more she dedicates herself to that in every possible way. So now the Virgin Mary is the extreme cosmic version of that, where she has to be perpetual virgin. She is a cosmic virgin. She is perpetually virgi virginal because she's like, you can imagine like in order for the sun to reflect upon the waters, it you has know, to be You know, and all still. those men who don't believe that sort of thing should take <laughs> careful stock of the fact that they're frequently terrified out of their skull whenever they encounter someone they're attracted to. Mm -hmm. They project that or see it instantly and, it, and it, 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 it demolishes them. And then if they're rejected, they're crushed. And you can think of that as a projection, but you can also think of it as seeing more deeply what's there and that you only see that when you're actually attracted to someone. Mm -hmm. And then that attraction has a basis because you're seeing what they could be, even if you're not seeing what's there. And so that's, so the, that's why the necessity of virgin birth, because she, she is revealing the highest, right? She's like, the, she's like a still ocean which is, on which the sun is reflecting. And if it was mitigated, then it would only reflect a mitigated manner. And then everything in between is mitigated. Like I said, it's like a woman who's faithful to her husband, obviously is not a virgin in a technical sense. You could say she's, she's a virginal to others. She's untouched by others, but she's dedicated to the one man, just like. Well, and you know, the degree to which that's entangled with genuine virginity also isn't the case, also isn't so obvious. Yeah. You know, it isn't, we don't know what the preconditions are for for setting up the ideal relationship. And, and it's certainly the case that we bring the baggage of our previous relationships into our current relationship. And maybe sometimes that's for the better and maybe the virginity can be symbolic, but people can certainly be sullied by their past behavior and sometimes in a way that they can't figure out how to, how to, how to repair. Yeah, well, for sure the Christian ideal has always been the, the, the union of virgins in the sense that then the dedication ends up being tighter, 
right? And so you are dedicated to your husband and your husband is dedicated to you. And, and then you're unmitigated mentally even, right? Like in terms of memories and in terms of comparing and in terms of all of these things which we do as human beings. Uh, and so it, it, it can prevent slippage in terms of your dedication. So I don't know if that makes sense in terms of yes, understanding well, I, I, why. I wasn't, I mean, you know, these <laughs> things, grasping these things slips out in and out of my capacity. And I mean, I, you, you did a lovely job there of, 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 of making a symbolic account for the virginity of Mary. I, I understand that. I understand. Well, but no one's going to prove the virginity of Mary historically. I mean, that, that, that's not, that's something which is not that obviously is not possible. It's a secret. There's a secret aspect to virginity, which is actually part of its function. And is also part of its, how can I say this? It's part of its, of its mystery, right? Which is something which is, which is not public. You know, it's, 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 it belongs to the identity. It belongs to the, you know, it's like the, the dedication of something belongs to that, which is it's dedicated, right? We can it talk about to this to some degree. I mean, yeah. I, Imagine that you wanted to form the perfect union with someone. Hmm. Let's say it's the perfect sexual union for that matter. I think that requires love. I, whenever I've had in my life a, a sexual experience that wasn't associated with love, uh, it, I didn't feel right about it. I, my hmm. conscience bothered me very much, very rapidly. And maybe that makes me an outlier, although I don't think so. I think, I think that that is how people react, but they refuse to notice. Hmm. Now, I might be wrong about that. Maybe I'm a prude. It's possible, although I don't think so. But it's possible. But it always struck me that sex was best undertaken within the confines of a committed, of an ultimately committed relationship. That otherwise it was lesser. It was the lesser, it was less than it should be. It was sullied. Hmm. And I, now, well, I don't have anything more to say about that than that that's been my experience. And so, and I don't know what the preconditions are for establishing the perfect marriage, let's say, and the perfect marriage would be one that brought about the best possible children. These are hmm. not trivial things. They're very difficult things to get right. Certainly you want the least amount of animosity unnecessary animosity possible between the parents. You want the union to be tight. You want it to be based on love and commitment. That seems clear even from the psychological literature. Yeah. So I have another question for yeah, you. Yeah, go for it, go for it. This idea of theosis. I think it's lack of I, I'm tormented by the possibility that it's lack of courage that stops people from from bringing into being that union with God. Do you think you think that possibility, that possibility there sits there in front of all of us and it was actually realized once in history? Well, it, I would say that at least in the, in the tradition of the church, it was perfectly manifested in Christ, but there are, th there are other saints that have reached theosis. And that, that's what we're all called to, that we're all called to, to become one with God to the extent that that's, that that's possible. You well, know? then I guess we're stuck with the old problem, which is if that's the case, then wh why does the world seem so unredeemed? Yeah. Well, because we're, we're distracted, you know, with reason where we, we tend to attend to the lower things, you know, we, we, we get distracted by our, our emotions. We get distracted by all these things around us that are trying to get our attention. And then we aim towards these smaller things. You know, we, we aim towards, whatever it is, right? We aim towards making money. We aim towards uh, getting this or having some prestige. And these, because the, the problem is that these things all give us a, a, a small sense of satisfaction. And so they, they are like little idols, I guess you could call them. Um, 
And so we just aim toward these these lower things. And and that's one of the reasons why we struggle to see this higher ideal, you know. And so that's one of the reasons why I guess what's one of the reasons for church as well is that, you know, it's kind of forces you even if you're distracted or whatever to come together at least once a week or whatever stand yes together yes, well that, and yes, sing together yes. and well and to and to constant i know i i understand that that yeah you no know, you know i remember cynicism that was sort of in the air i suppose when the christianity of my youth started to decompose when people started to not attend church in droves the cynical Justification in part was, well, those are one hour a week Christians. How hypocritical can you get to claim allegiance to this high ideal and then to go back and live your tawdry life? How could anyone participate in anything like that? And what we've replaced it with is never doing it, even for an hour a week, which is actually quite a lot of time compared to none. Yeah. So the replacement has not been an improvement by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, and so and then we re we replace it because we need to come together and we need to commune and we need to celebrate, and so we end up doing it in in these kind of secondary places like sports or politics and all these other places. You know, will will replace that, but uh, ultimately, like I said, one of the things that help us to trust, let's say, or or to find some respite is that we do it's together like we're doing this together and so the exact when you see there's some comfort in knowing that that some people have dedicated their life to god and have lived that way and it serves as a smaller example but also as a as a comfort in those moments because usually in the stories of the saints you'll find times when they are struggling when they're they're completely off the rails when they're not you know, when they're struggling with thoughts, with passions, with desires. Well, you see that in the Old Testament stories. I mean, Abraham is a, all of the all the patriarchs. I mean, they lived full lives, complete with catastrophic failure and and malevolence and murder and genocide and war. Yeah. And I mean, and and yet were redeemed. Hmm. And so I think that that's one of the things that helps us to to, like you said, to 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 see it's like you, you don't you don't have to obviously you don't look at the person who goes to church once a once a year or whatever that person has their own thing to deal with you 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 find and you see these these people that are the opposite that really live and and everybody has met i would say probably a few people like that at least i've met a few that are just i've met some priests uh monk priests that are glowing like they're just glowing and they, and you see it in their eyes that they live at a level of of peace and acceptance that I don't have access to. And so it's like that type of encounter is also part of your transformation because it gives you, it tells you like, oh yeah, I see it in your eyes. Like I can see that, that, that this exists, you know, it's not just something we talk about. I want, I want to talk a little bit about heaven. So I talked to Matt Ridley a while back and, and, and Bjorn Lomberg and, I'm interested in their thinking because they're trying to plot an optimistic course for the future, one where at the highest levels of social integration, we decide how human society should look, at least insofar as we conceptualize how it might look if we address some of the major problems that beset us. But it's an attempt, and it's an attempt to make things better. It's an attempt to bring about something increasingly resembling heaven on earth. I mean, heaven is generally conceptualized. You can conceptualize it as a state of being. It might be the state of being that those people that you described live in. I've had paradisal experiences where everything transformed itself into something that was perfect, that appeared perfect. And I was unable to stay in those frames of mind. The, the heaven, is that something we build? Is that something? I don't understand the relationship be, between the heaven that awaits us, let's say, after we die. That's the, the idea. And what we build here on earth. Do those touch? Is that, the do, is that the doctrine? There's so much of this doctrine I don't understand. 
at well, all. I think I think a way to to see it has to do with with attention again, and it has to do with a hierarchy of attention. If you try to build heaven, you're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably because you because you're not aiming high enough, right? You're you're aiming, and then you you get stuck in this in these weird world of opposites that you don't even understand the side effects of what you're doing, you know? Um, and so for one person, heaven will look like if everything could be perfectly ordered then, right? And then we know what that looks like. And another person will look at heaven and think if everything could be free, if we could all just be free, and then that we know what that looks like. And so the idea is to look higher. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a story that well, I've been Well, we have meditating. to strive for something better, but then we end up in, which is what you're saying, is that we end up with the Tower of Babel, or we end up with the Flood, or we end up with, yep. with, with the, the catastrophe, continual catastrophe of unintended consequences. But as you yourself said, we are aiming for something better. So, so the question is, how do you pursue, pursue utopia while avoiding the pitfalls? And that's a theological question, I would yeah, I it would is. say. And I, I think it, I know this, people are going to hate that I say this, but it, it has to do with worship. It's, it has to do with what you worship. So if you worship, if you worship those things that you're aiming towards, the lower things, if you worship the, the making a safer society, if you worship the making a freer society, if you worship making a stronger society, all of these things are going to go off the rails because they, they have unintended consequences that you don't understand mm -hmm. because they're they're a fragment of reality mm -hmm. you know they need to be encompassed together in order to reach something higher and so that's the, the danger of ideology it's the part takes the place of the whole so the 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 the, the idea is that if you actually if you worship god then those other things will will kind of lay themselves out slowly and you won't be able to force them. They'll, they'll kind of lay themselves out slowly and they'll start to manifest, uh, you know, progressively and, and, and as you, but you have to attend to the highest or else, like I said, you know, and there's a, there's even like a, there's an image of antichrist, which is related to this problem. You know, uh, in scripture, you could, one of the first antichrists you could say was Judas who betrayed Christ. Well, there's a story with Judas, which is very fascinating because Christ doesn't talk to Judas very often. But one of the places where Christ talks to Judas is when a woman comes in and wants to anoint and wash Christ's feet with a very expensive perfume. Yep. And then Judas says, what, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? You need to, why don't we give this to the poor, right? And Christ says, you know, the poor will always be with you, but the bridegroom, Christ, the Messiah is there for a short time. And yes, so the that's idea, the other kind of story. It's very difficult to understand how anyone could have invented that story. <laughs> like, it's not the story of propagandists. No. It's in fact, it's the opposite. Yeah. But that story has to do with attention. So Christ obviously isn't saying you shouldn't help the poor. Christ is said to help the poor. He said it many times. You have to help the poor, give to the poor, of course. But he's saying, get your hier hierarchy in order. And you'll help the poor more effectively that's that way right. than any other. That's that's the case. There is that is the so case. So it's like it starts with worship and the acts that she's doing. If you look at what she's doing, she's first of all she bought something expensive. She's sacrificing it. She's she's sacrificing it to 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 bow down and to wash the feet, to submit, to sacrifice to, and to worship. So those three things. Like when I talk about the aim, how you end up having to submit to that aim. And so this is what. So Christ is saying. First comes worship, then the world lays itself out below that in, a, in an appropriate way. And those That's that what are, the Sermon on the Mount says, too. Yeah. And those that are, tr are saying help the poor as their ultimate goal, in, the, in Scripture it says that Judas didn't even want to help the poor. He wanted to take the money for himself, really. Like he was a thief, actually, and he was taking the money out of the purse. And so those that just want to reduce... Well, I suppose the truth of the matter is, is that the genuineness of your desire to help the poor is precisely proportional to the degree that you embody Christ. That's right. I, and I, it can't be otherwise. It cannot be otherwise. I, I, I see that. I see that clearly uh, because otherwise things will go astray. So that's one of the problems with the modern projects of utopia is that they're, they're babylesque in their attempts. And you can see like the type of gestures that the world 
authorities are posing in terms of in terms of safety, extreme, like you know, with COVID and everything, this desire to create absolute safety, this desire to create absolute identification and and tracing and all of these weird, these kind of weird gestures that show that they think they can control reality is is uh it's leading us towards a very dangerous place. Well, one of the things I noticed, uh, I did some work on a committee at one point that was advising the UN in relationship to the establishment of its millennial goals. And there was hundreds of goals, never not rank ordered. And so it was a Tower of Babel because there, you can't have hundreds of goals that aren't rank ordered and have any goals at all. Because the goal to have a goal means a hierarchy. Something has to be more important than something else. And there isn't anything more important than getting your act together, so to speak, you know. Yeah. And, well, I'm going to have to think about all this a, a lot. Hmm. Yeah. But there's the question that keeps lurking in, in the back of my mind, which is, Does the fact that that's how it should be mean that that's the way that it is? And that's trust. That's a question of trust. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a it's a it's a question of trust with which ends up manifesting itself in love, you know. Um, and I think that like the love that you have for the world, which is which is which is clear. Anyways, it shows me that you might be closer to that, to that trust than, than you might want to admit to yourself, maybe. Well, I don't know what to do with it, I suppose, is the real problem, especially in my current circumstances. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the most confused person I've ever met, <clears throat> I would mm. say. Yeah. And I've met some pretty confused people, so. <laughs> well, thank you. That it's was great. really something. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really a joy to talk to you, Jordan. And, you know, like I said, there are thousands of people who are praying for you and... and well, they're keeping and me alive. And your story isn't, isn't, your story isn't over yet, you know. <laughs> so much the pity for me. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I really, all I can do is really pray that you, that you, yeah, that you, I don't know how to, how to formulate it, but I, I hope that you, that you, that you encounter a, a moment of grace and that you can also find, find a, a, a body to join with. And I'm always here, you know, like I, I, we haven't talked in a few years, but, uh, Obviously, you're well, more part so of my life. There's only so much I can stand talking to you. you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're more, you're more, you're definitely always a part of my life. You know, even if if it's through weird YouTube videos and everything, you know, and and uh, people remind me that you're a part of my life all the time because a lot of people that watch my videos, you know, they they come they come from you. They're always they always start with, well, I was watching Jordan Peterson videos, and so. So you're a you're a gateway to to uh, you're you're a gateway to what I'm talking about, you know. So I well, I that's a good that. gateway. <laughs> Thank you for the carving. It's beautiful. Right. I'm happy to know that it's there, that it's in your house, and that Saint Michael is uh, is at least holding that dragon at bay a little bit. We hope. Yeah. Good talking to you. Yeah, it's good talking to Jordan. Anytime. Thank you.